and the bladder. Now you can imagine, those are the two of the more important parts of our, our bodies, right? Is we want, if we can't pee, we are in super big trouble immediately, um, even more than if, if our rectum isn't working. Um, and if we can't reproduce as a species, we're, we're done for. So species-wide, these are, are very important structures, so we want to make sure something is there to protect it. So not only do we have the fatty tissue, right, that's that pubic mound, but the pubic bone as well. I have another Kegel question. Please. Um, I've heard that people say to also exercise that like for more pleasure during sex, like people say flex during sex. Yes, <laughs> most of it comes from um, the idea of heterosexual sex and to the male. Uh, because you can squeeze the inner you know, walls of your vagina and make it a tighter entrance. Well, not really, like, not, really. <laughs> not from what I've uh, understood, yeah. Uh, so the urethra, the, the interesting thing about the urethra in females is it's incredibly short. Right? For males, it's going to travel quite a ways. Uh, they're going to have some loops in there. It's very exciting. Um, but for women, it is almost immediate, right? A few inches in, uh, we already have the bladder. So bladder infections, very, very common for females um, because bacteria has very, very little to go. It just has to go right there. Um, it's true that it does help with bladder infections to pee after sex. What happens is um, sex juices, right? <laughs> Vaginal secretions and, and semen and whatever else you're working with, saliva, all kinds of things, um, get stuck in there. And so it's bacteria you're not used to. Right? And so what happens is if you pee after sex, that flushes that out and can cause less UTIs. Does that make sense? Huh? I can stop right now, or we can finish this up and then take a break a little bit later. What would you like? All right, I'm going to finish up. I, I'm, I feel like we're on a roll, so just making sure nobody was like, I have to have a break or I'm going to die. All right. All right, so there's that glans clitoris. Oh, I did want to show you a couple other things. So we've only recently understood this, right? But I want to show you some recent models that I've gotten in the last, I would say, about five years. Um, these two models. One, ah. ooh, one is uh, from NuvaRing. So I have less expectations for them uh, because it's not really a medical model. It's just supposed to show how a NuvaRing goes in there. We'll talk about NuvaRings later. But what I want to point out is um, they're Their clitoris is totally wrong in every way. And this is how it would have looked when I was in college. They thought it was just a little wormy thing. That's it, it just kind of ended, but it's done. Right? Now we know right, it goes all the way past. As you can see in this one, I still don't like it because it doesn't show the urethra bulb, but at least it shows that it goes past the urethra and the vaginal canal. Right? This is nice for other things, but. However, this one did come from a medical supply company. I had Red Rocks buy this, so it wasn't even just a swag. Um, so this is from a medical supply company, right, to teach people about anatomy. Same thing, this is completely wrong. The whole point of this is to show us female anatomy, and it is completely, utterly wrong. We haven't bothered. Right? We haven't bothered to fix this because we haven't cared enough. Is it just the clitoris that's wrong? Yes, the clitoris. Because that's the newest piece of information, right? But new meaning 1998. <laughs> that's from 1998? No, that's from five years ago. The information we've known since 1998, but we haven't bothered to update things, um, even in our teaching models. And that's it. It's crazy. <coughs> All right, so there's the urinary opening, right? Right down from the bladder. You've seen that. The vaginal opening. So there's the hymen. The hymen can be fairly close to the opening. It can be farther down. It's usually within about a, an inch. Um, what is a hymen? Hymen like went over. Anybody know? Well, is 
Does it have blood associated with it? Because that's what that like crazy pop and cherry and things like blood. Yeah, it's really grosser when you think about it like that, right? <laughs> yeah. Like, oh, cherry, nice little fruit, but now no, it doesn't mean blood. Yeah, so there, it is a structure that has blood inside of it, so when it is torn, it uh, bleeds. But it depends on the person. Um, for some women, they have a very thin hymen, and you wouldn't see any blood, or not any significant amounts of blood. I am unfortunate enough to know that my mother's hymen was quite thick and had to have a doctor cut it, because sex was very painful, and then they realized why. I know a lot about my parents' sex life. <laughs> I don't know what to say. <laughs> um, so is it, com is it a closed structure? Is it like a wall? Yes. No. Because if it was a closed structure, nothing could come out, right? including menstrual blood. So it, it has perforations, which mean tiny holes. I really like, your book does a great job of showing different hymens. Um, because they are all different. Some have larger holes, some have smaller holes, some have people that the holes stretch enough where they can fit a tampon on without damaging the hymen. Um, it really just depends. Why would we want something that covers the vaginal canal? Yeah, all comes back to protection. Right? Let's imagine for a moment we're swimming in a lake. Freddy Krueger pops up. <laughs> I'm, I'm less scared of Freddy Krueger than I am whatever else is <laughs> swimming around down there, right? Because we have open body parts, right ladies? I mean, that's what happens. So we want something there to keep all that stuff out, right? We really need it when we're younger because we don't have really strong immune systems. So anything we encounter, we, we develop, right? We'll talk about that with STIs too. So for as long as possible, we want our immune system to be healthy, strong, before you think it's in our vagina that shouldn't be there, right? <laughs> but that's just from a biological point of view, right? That's why we would want that. So we add all the other stuff about it stabilizing virginity and all that other stuff. Uh, I, um, another sexuality student of mine said that hers broke um, when she was on one of those uh, Penny horses, like in King Supers. Well, she had fallen off of it and hit herself right on the the um, the foot hold thing and tore her hymen. Like I was like, holy crap! Like what? That's that's quite a fall, you know. Uh, but she was like six years old. Um, so that's that's very common for things to happen like that. Um, but we, in some cultures, it's been, it really has literally meant death. If, if there was not blood on the sheets, it was, that was death for that person. Usually in the medieval um, times where, uh, with royalty, mm -hmm. right? because then that was, you were, you were lying to us about it. All right, so there are a few things that you will have heard when I talk about um, spots of pleasure and more of them that you haven't. Um, which one are you familiar with? A G spot, right? Um, that elusive G spot. Uh, well, we're going to talk about two other spots. Um, the first one we're going to talk about is the U spot. So the U spot is around the urethra. Um, most women find it to be below the urethra. Uh, so right below the urethra, between the vaginal opening and the urethra, there seems to be a pleasure spot. How will you know if you or your partner uh, is affected by that spot? You can figure it out. You just touch it, yeah. Is that, is that in it, in it? All right. <laughs> um, yeah, you experiment, right? And it's, I, I encourage you to experiment with these. Uh, you may find that, oh my God, I didn't even know that that was a thing for me and I love that spot. Um, so it all just depends. It's a, it's a fun scavenger hunt, right? Uh, the cervix, what's important about the cervix and what's one of the things you might know? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, yeah, the diaphragm goes on, on right onto that cervix. Um, ladies, most of you have gotten uh, what? Pap smear. I was going to say scrapes. Yeah, that's great. So with a pap smear, they are scraping this little donut-shaped 
uh, muscle right here, uh, or uh, it's a sphincter muscle, um, to see if the cells are healthy. Right? Uh, we'll talk about uh, STIs and how that affects the cervix as well. Uh, but yeah, that's what keeps the baby in. Right? We're going to develop what we call a mucus plug. I just love these terms for stuff. Mucus plug that keeps the baby from falling out. Um, some women have a very weakened cervix, and so actually will sew it up while, while they're pregnant, so that that does not happen. Um, but for most women, that, that's not an issue. But if you hear bed rest, that the person is on bed rest, that's usually what that's referring to, is there's some problem with their cervix, and the baby's gonna come out, so they don't wanna do that. Exactly. If it was that easy, right? <laughs> I thought it was. All right, the AFE spot, another one that you probably not heard of. I have to get my notes here to be able to spell it because it's terrible. All right, it's the anterior, which just means front part. Anterior fornix, which means arch. Erogenous zone. And that just means it feels good, right? So the AFE spot is supposed to be right in front of the cervix. Some people have said it's, it's more towards the back. The person who originally developed it um, said that it was in the front. Um, one of the things I'm going to say over and over and over again is every body is different. So every body reacts differently. Um, it just depends. Uh, experiment and find out how your body works or your partner's body works. So what we'll find if we're looking at toys are things like this. Um, what do you notice about that toy? It's what? It's hooks. Yeah, we'll see a lot of those hooks for spots. Um, so that you can do a tapping motion like this. That's how you, you engage that spot. What else do you notice about it? Uh, like a switch on the end? Yep, that's how to turn it on. That, one, that particular one vibrates. You want it to don't vibrate too. Anything else you notice about it? It's purple. That's right. <laughs> That's to match your stuff. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> no, actually, I was just looking at it. It's, it's quite long. Um, that's the big difference you'll see with uh, these toys that are for AFE spots is they're longer than most um, because they have a ways to go. Um, the, we'll talk about ones that you don't need that much, that much length for that. Uh, questions about the AFE spot? to go home. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, the rectum. So this is uh, where the poop is held at the very end. Um, I found out just recently that there are two chambers to the rectum. That um, it will fill in the first chamber and then when you're close to a bathroom um, it will go to the second chamber. And you know, like when you go home, you're like, oh my god, I really have to go now. Um, and if you don't get to a bathroom, if there's like, oh my god, it's it's the bathroom has been destroyed, it will actually come back up to that second, that first chamber. I know, I didn't know that. That was that was pretty interesting. It has nothing to do with sexuality, but man, that's interesting, right? <laughs> um, so the thing about anal sex is that the rectum does not act the same way as the vagina does. It doesn't have the same protectants, it doesn't have the same stretchability. Um, so what can happen is because the walls are very thin, is it can lacerate, it can tear. Right? So if the walls are torn, then you have a, a quick way into the bloodstream. Right? So when we talk about things like HIV, one of the reasons why anal sex is a more dangerous act is that if it tears the, the rectum and then um, fluids are put in there, like semen, then it goes right into the bloodstream. Right? How do we solve that? With that condom? Condoms. And? What's our best friend? Lube. Lube. Lube is always our friend. Yeah. Lube is our best friend. I was going to say abstinence. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about that. Um, what, what are the, what's the user effectiveness of abstinence? We're going to discuss it. 
Uh, the vaginal canal, we talked about that one. Um, it's not particularly long. Um, it depends on the person. But for most people, for most women, uh, most people with vaginas, you can fit your finger to your cervix, depending on the length of your fingers as well. Um, that's where you put in the diaphragm. So that's what you have to reach in order to put that diaphragm on. Um, there has been some studies that have looked at the, the length between the clitoris and the uh, vaginal canal. One of the things we're going to talk about when we get to uh, sexual response next time is that most of the nerve endings are, are in the front, the interior part of the vagina. So you don't have to go that far in to experience them, right? And one of the things that may be causing all orgasms is clitoral stimulation. Right? One of the things that, that uh, um, the artist showed was that uh, um, we should have the right for pleasure no matter how it happens. Most women do not experience vaginal orgasms in terms of only penetration causing that orgasm. That's about a third. We see a lot of thirds on this. About a third of women can experience vaginal penetration orgasms. But what we're finding is that if the, the clitoris is quite close to the vaginal opening, that's more likely. So what really might be happening is when penetration happens, So when penetration happens, what's actually happening is it's starting to pull down on that wishbone, right? We have that wishbone there. And so it's really just pulling down on that, and the, that is actually causing the orgasm, is the clitoral stimulation. Does that make sense? Yeah, and actually the opposite is really true, <laughs> and we ignore it. And the idea that, yeah, after a couple of pushes uh, that the woman will have an orgasm of some kind without touching her in any way, just with her penis. <laughs> yeah, that's just, that's just not going to happen. <laughs> uh, yeah. And that stops us from giving and getting pleasure, too, if we think that that, that person really is done, that person has had an orgasm, um, we're not going to do anything else to cause it. We'll talk about that. We'll get to that too. Communication is a good one. All right, so uh, the G spot. Uh, so that's the one you've heard of. Anybody know why we call it G spot? It's the G spot. It's the original gay spot. Original gay spot. That would be the OG spot. <laughs> Which is what we call it. So I'm like, oh, G. Uh, no, it's uh, named after the doctor who discovered it, uh, Grafenberg. No. Yes. Yes. <laughs> But I will give it to him. If I discovered a spot, I would name it after myself, Dan. Yeah. Right? The oat spot? Yes, yeah. How did he discover it? Do what? How did he discover it? Um, you know, you, the article that you'll be looking at for the first paper actually does talk about that. And I don't remember. I don't remember what the story is. So you'll know better than I will um, after you look at that. Uh, but I'll bring that next time. So the, for the first paper, we'll look at all that stuff next time when we finish up and out. All right, so uh, back to that. So when we look at G-spot toys, we're going to find something a little different. So much shorter, right? Because the G-spot is fairly close to the opening. Um, it's about a finger away. So we've already talked. I've got consent from her. She's, she's okay with this. So how you find the G-spot is you insert a finger or two or however many you like, um, and you tap up. This area will become hardened and ridged. Uh, you can feel it with your fingers. Um, it, it just becomes very different, and that's when you know that that's the spot. So if you're not feeling that, then tap in a few other areas, and once it becomes hardened and ridged, you know that's the spot to go for. For some women, that is associated with that female ejaculation. That's the G-spot stimulation specifically that causes it. Um, for some reason, for some women, that has nothing to do with that. Uh, some women. Um, have more ejaculation when they use the AFE spot. For some women, it doesn't happen. So it's still unknown territory, right? There's still a lot of things we don't know about all this stuff. Questions about the G spot? Why is it so much more known than the other spot? It was the first one to be discovered. The other ones came later. Yeah. 
and then everybody got all excited about it. But I, I, I just, I really love this idea that it's elusive. Like it's, oh, we never, we don't know where the G spot is, mm -hmm. and uh, it, no, it's, it's pretty easy to find. And actually, you can feel it. So <laughs> it's, it's not as elusive as we might think. But um, I guess you can't put like, we'll touch it and you'll know, you know, on a, on a slide like that. Uh, there's the perineum, we already saw that. That does have a lot of exposed nerve endings as well, right? That's just the underside. Um, and then there's the anus. Um, we already talked about that. I don't think I have anything to add on that one. Um, all right, questions before we take a break? Are you overwhelmed? All right, so let's take a break. Smoke them if you've got them or somebody else has got them too. You might need a cigarette by now. Um, we'll take a little more of a 10 minute break, so we'll come back at 10 to 10 to 11. Finish her up. You take a break too. <laughs> 